Now we begin here on Wednesday. Everyone in the Democratic Party and beyond getting ready for something that we know will happen. Millions of viewers will for the first time really assess the Democratic field, which is really historic in a lot of measurable ways. It has the oldest candidate ever, Bernie at 77, and the youngest, Pete at 37. Six women candidates, the most ever in either party, and the first openly gay candidate to run in a presidential race, Mayor Pete. Now only two of these 20 candidates have done a nationally televised presidential campaign debate before. Think about that. Only Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. The rest are taking a rookie turn at a high stakes challenge, though most have debated at least at some lower level of politics. This is the first time I've ever run for public office. I want to be a strong public advocate who can stand up to the mayor. We want an attorney general who has a plan. It is safer for a bicycle to be on the road and not on the sidewalk. This is an exciting time to be in our business and no better time to be president. I've been very proud to represent Vermont for eight years. Now, unlike some of the folks you just saw, unlike Warren, de Blasio, Harris, Buttigieg, who all did local debates, there are other candidates stepping out on the stage this week that have never done any major political debates. And in a typical political era, that would seem like a disadvantage. But if we learned anything last cycle, didn't we learn that many voters are sick of traditional experience? The man who won the Republican nomination had no debate experience at the time, let alone governing experience. And while few Democrats say anything Donald Trump does inspires them, he certainly did show that long shot political novices can go far, something that may be on the minds of several of these less famous, less debate experienced candidates you're about to hear from this week. Now, I'm joined by Cecile Richards, former president of Planned Parenthood Federation of America and the co-founder of Supermajority, a women's political action group and someone who's dealt with candidates at every level. We should note that her daughter is serving on Senator Kamala Harris's team. And MSNBC political analyst Mike Murphy, a veteran of a whole bunch of Republican presidential campaigns. Good evening to both of you. Good evening. Hello. With those novices who, as we know, uh, you can underestimate at your peril. Uh, it's an exercise in intellectual and political humility uh, to see what happens on the debate stage. What do you think of, of some of the lesser known candidates' chances this week uh, on the Democratic stage? Well, Ari, you're absolutely right because they're dangerous as they have very little to lose and they're desperate to break out and get noticed to have a moment that they can hopefully run down the table as this very long process continues. So I think on night one, uh, and this will get laughters uh, around the studio there in New York, but keep an eye on de Blasio. He is used to the rough and tumble of New York City media. He can communicate and he's extremely comfortable with progressive politics and speaking that language in the Democratic primary. And his expectations are so low, anything is up. So I would keep an eye on him. I would keep an eye on Amy Klobuchar, who's got to do something to start her campaign, a little bit of energy or else her fundraising is going to dry up, even though, again, the voter stuff is later. And finally, Cory Booker uh, has had a pretty good week because he's been able to engage in Biden. I think he's a little jealous of about night two where Kamala Harris will be the one on stage with uh, Vice President Biden to give him a little sensitivity training. And then you got Elizabeth Warren who gets her own night, but Bernie, Biden, the biggest opponents, at least in the early polling, they're on another night. So she gets to be star of a show, but she's on a, a thing full of people trying to get her. But, that brings but me to, the one to percenters, one more I, I think, keep an eye on de Blasio and Ryan. Yeah, and one more thing I want to ask you before I bring in Cecile, then, is given your experience, uh, those of us who are junkies know exactly how this pit was picked with these two nights and all that. But other years, there have been sort of first tier, second tier nights. Do you think, based on your knowledge of the, of the way sporadic voters are going to come in and tune in, is it possible that folks will misperceive that one night is supposed to be bigger than the other for the reasons you just mentioned? Oh, sure, sure. But, you know, the, the problem with these debates are we cover everyone like the Super Bowl. There are going to be 12 Super Bowls at least. So everybody gets another bite at the apple. It's really going to be, I think, the second night, the Biden versus Mayor Pete versus Kamala Harris versus Bernie show that is going to attract most of the attention afterward. But everybody's got something to lose. And maybe some of the smaller candidates will find a way to, you know, get up a notch. Cecile, uh, same questions all the above to you as, as well as whatever else you want to add in? 
Sure, thanks. Well, I mean, this is obviously historic. It's so exciting to think that we have six women, more people of color than have ever run for president. And for a lot of voters, this is the first time they've actually had a good a good opportunity to look at these women candidates. Um, I think we're going to, and these are women candidates who've never lost a race. They are absolutely prepared. I think we've seen enormous uh, pro, you know, like policies coming out of them, everything. And the, the, the critical voters in the Democratic primary uh, and, and in the general election are women voters and women uh, of color. I was just looking at the recent poll from The Hill, which said that 62 percent of women are not inclined to, to vote for uh, President Trump again. So how women see these candidates, uh, what they do in this primary is going to be critical. That's where all the energy is right now. Uh, and I'm I don't know. I've been so impressed. I just hope we see moderators ask the women and the men the same kinds of questions, because there are a lot of there are a lot of issues on the minds of women voters, uh, economic inequality, equal pay the lack of affordable child care, lack of affordable health care. I hope that they ask all the candidates those questions because yeah. it's time we start comparing apples to apples. Well, and, and as you mentioned that, you know, Joe Biden uh, has been running into cross currents that are partly about his extensive experience, which often can be a negative in presidential politics, and also about uh, two sets of issues you just alluded to, women's issues as well as civil rights. Uh, take a listen to him talking about uh, an issue you've worked on, which is how the federal government is limited in health care that relates to abortion services, specifically the quote unquote Hyde Amendment. Take a look. Although the Hyde Amendment was designed to try to split the difference here to make sure women still had access, you can't have access if in fact everyone's covered by a federal policy. And so that's why I, at the same time I announced that policy, I announced that I can no longer continue to ab abide by the Hyde Amendment. I'd like to ask you both, Cecile and then Mike, A, briefly, your view on the policy claim there, and then B, the politics, which is you don't have to be a political expert to hear someone saying they're announcing a policy, yada, yada. What he's really saying is he's changed his position under pressure. Cecile. Yeah, well, I look, I think, again, women voters are going to determine this election. They were 54 percent of the voters in 2018. They will likely be that much or more in, in 2020. You have to win women, and women are deeply concerned about what's happening with abortion rights in this country. We see Alabama, Missouri, Georgia. You could go down the list. And so where a candidate stands on access to safe and legal abortion, a right that women have had for more than 40 years, is absolutely essential, along with all the access to affordable affordable health care, which I think, again, it was a critical issue in 2018. It's going to be a defining issue in 2020. You know, I see it a little differently. Uh, on the Hyde stumble, it was a bad stumble. It's a problem Biden's always going to have because he's been fighting the good fight in the Democratic Party for four decades, and the definition of the good fight has changed over time. So it, we can relitigate stuff from the past, and I thought he stumbled in how he handled it. But there is a danger in this Democratic primary because the short-term incentives are to have a race among activists who pay the attention early to see who's the most woke. A group of women voters that are going to have a lot to do with whether uh, Donald Trump is reelected or not. And I agree, he has a problem with women. But, you know, one out of every six voters is a pro-life woman. And unless and Mike, the Democrats how do you, Mike, can Mike, how do you define woke? Huh? Well, I, I think it's this race to a combination of very liberal economics, very populist economics on the left, which is kind of the other side of Trump's populism on the right, and then all this identity politics. So my point is... <laughs> The Democrats can run a primary, let me just quickly finish, and run up the energy on the left, but if they don't pull votes out of five or 600 counties and hold Trump down a little, which are full of grumpy old white people who aren't so woke, they could have the same outcome where they get a bigger national vote, even bigger than the Hillary's win, and still lose the election in the Electoral College. So it's a hard and mind struggle in the party, mm. and that's hard to do in a primary where everybody's trying to win the election tomorrow, which is going to be 90 percent progressive, or well, 50 Cecile, to 60 percent progressive. Cecile's been encouraging moderators to ask everyone the same question, so I, I put the question to her. How do you define woke, and, and what's your response to Mike? <laughs> 
Well, I don't think woke is the issue. I think the, the, the issue is that there are basic issues of access to affordable health care, access to affordable wages. I mean, two thirds of minimum wage workers are women in this country. They haven't had a raise for 10 years. Access to affordable child care. This is the second highest cost for most families. It's not just a women's issue. It's a family issue. It's a men's issue as well. These are the issues that are on the minds of American women. And they, I say again, they are going to be the vast majority of voters in this country. They are energized. They are active more than ever in, in, in our history. And they're going to determine the future of this presidential mm. election. So I think these issues are critically important. I define Look, it as, I as disagree. being Women well, Mike, hold on. Be important. Mike, They're, I got to get something important yeah. here. I define it as the state of, of being awake or not asleep. Well, if you define it as being awake and not asleep, that's where women are. And I mean, we saw <laughs> women again. You know, we've had more people march, resist, protest this, wow. this president. You see what she did there, Mike? History. God, I feel like I'm talking to two uh, skilled yeah. uh, politically rhetorical strategists. Um, they're telling me I'm out of time, but I did sort of interrupt. Mike, briefly, if you want to add anything. No, the numbers in the general election say it's about more than any one voter group, and it's about taking votes away from Trump, not reinforcing the messages you have. If it was all about that, Hillary Clinton would have won. Well, and, and there are folks who would say, well, well Hillary Clinton did, did get, more votes. get more votes, but the, the question being where. Not where it counted. Not where it counted. I don't think that's in dispute anymore. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.